person. He's very intelligent. He's got a good heart. He's an incredible lawyer. Uh, he just published a book called The Courtroom is My Theater. And I also saw him interviewed on the Brooklyn, I mean the Bro Jewish Broadcasting System. And I was really impressed and I don't get impressed too often. So here he is and we're going to continue talking about, I call it the criminal injustice system. And we'll stop, but you know, we, we mentioned on the very first show, Afghanistan, and we were talking about presidents should have experience, combat experience, have served before they take over our forces. And we went through a lot of examples. And you, you started out, I think, with Bush 43. Well, uh, I don't think uh, it's necessary that the commander in chief have active duty uh, experience. Uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln didn't. Uh, FDR didn't. And uh, they were able to maintain a certain distance that made them the uh, uh, subject of positive uh, reviews in everything they did. Uh, I think the uh, uh, key is to have a person who, who can rise above politics, who could uh, do what is best for the country, even though it may offend uh, people in his party. Lyndon Johnson uh, was able to get the Civil Rights Act of 1965 passed uh, when the Southern Democrats were deeply opposed to what he was doing, but he pursued it because he believed it to be right, and he didn't have combat experience either. So I don't know, Joe, that uh, the commander-in-chief uh, requires uh, combat experience. It requires courage and the ability to rise above politics. The three people that you've mentioned were exceptional people. Well, what is that? They were exceptional, those, those right. three people. Well, the country was fortunate. And But we've had a series of presidents that didn't uh, serve in combat, that avoided going to war like Bush 43 and Clinton and Giuliani and uh, Cheney. All these people that were, you know, wanted to go to war, knew nothing about war, including Obama. And they got us into two wars. And, you know, Obama was the longest serving uh, war president, seven years in, Af you know, in Afghanistan. So uh, some of these people were pushed around by the military industrial complex. They, they couldn't stand up to them like John F. Kennedy could. He could because he was in the service and in combat. But some of these recent leaders, no. Uh, in, and uh, it, it's tragic if uh, a leader caves in to his Joint Chiefs of Staff or people around him and takes us to war. And, and we just keep doing this. But like you said, there are private interests involved. But, but uh, Joe, it's interesting to point out that the person with the most combat experience Dwight Eisenhower, during his tenure, we were not involved in any war. He saw firsthand what it was like to have a country at war, to stick your nose into other people's affairs, countrywide. And he kept our country free from war during his tenure. Remember, he was the president who built the interstate road systems. He occupied himself with uh, uh, programs that made 
our life better and more convenient. So it's odd that the man with the most combat experience knew how dangerous war was and he kept us from war, while the presidents who uh, don't know what war is uh, have no hesitancy in involving us in wars. Uh, the one that comes to my mind as the chief offender of the policy that I hold here, uh, that the government should not involve itself in other countries' affairs, is uh, uh, Obama and Bush, who had no hesitancy about involving us in what amounted to endless wars. And so I think uh, in many ways you're right that a man with combat experience knows what war is and keeps us from war. And those who don't know what war is have no compunction about bringing us into a uh, active war status. And that's a terrible thing for this country. Uh, you can't find a better example of a person who doesn't understand the risks of uh, uh, war than uh, Obama, uh, Trump, and uh, uh, Biden as they uh, pursue a uh, policy that can only lead and has led to failure and the loss of respect for this country. Yeah, I want to give you a ex personal experience. Uh, years ago, I met a young Marine just back from Iraq. His name was Doug Webb. He was in trouble with the law. And one of my surfing buddies said, help him. So I did. I got the case dismissed in the, in, in the furtherance of justice because of his uh, experiences in the Marine Corps, combat and everything else. The judge threw the case out. Obama, in 2012, was on Bagram Air, Air, Air Base. He was in a big hangar, it looked like. And he was standing in front of two armored vehicles. They were huge vehicles and telling us that we have to continue this war. We're doing the right thing. We have to win this war. The same day, my friend Doug, you know, now they can go back to their base and email people. They could actually call you. He went back to his base and he emailed me. And he said, this is the worst shithole in the world, talking about Afghanistan. He said, we got hit today. I had to pretend to be dead for hours. That's how I survived. Meanwhile, Obama's on Bagram Air, Air Base saying, we're going to stay here and do the job. And they had no idea. And, you know, and when he came home, and just, I was just um, an Afghan veteran came to see me Tuesday. One tour in Iraq, two in Afghanistan. He said the whole thing was crazy. The whole thing was crazy, the wars. And they have, these leaders don't understand what they're doing. You send these Americans out there in their prime. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we haven't won a war since uh, uh, we defeated Hitler and Japan. Yeah. We stuck our nose in Korea. We stuck our nose in Vietnam, Afghanistan. And as strong as we think we are, we failed in all these missions because as God is our judge, we were never meant to police areas as far away as Afghanistan and Korea. And uh, we suffered terribly. When I say we, I'm talking about the mothers who raise children only to see them pass for a cause that years <clears throat> later can never be justified. McNamara 
who was behind the war in Vietnam, wrote a book saying, in effect, he was sorry for all that he did to encourage the war that uh, uh, he pursued. But it's too late for the Gold Star families to uh, accept an apology. And McNamara never served either. It's very important to recognize that the person that had the most experience of any president, I would think since uh, Washington, Dwight Eisenhower, made it his uh, business to keep us from sticking our nose in the affairs of other countries' conduct and form of government to allow uh, our country to grow strong and independent without wasting resources and the lives of young men. And uh, my hat's off to Dwight Eisenhower. You won't find his name in the top five or ten presidents, but he is somebody who's worthy of uh, enormous accolades. And uh, uh, I just think I'm happy to be here because I sense that I've even given you, Joe, something to think about when you talk about combat experience, when you think about Eisenhower and Eisenhower's statement that war is hell. And it is. And you can't think about it, raising a child going with that child to school, homework, love and devotion, only to have that kid taken from the parents and killed. And it's so easy to say, oh, we lost uh, uh, 2,700 uh, lives. Uh, but every one is critical. Uh, and a child is a very important uh, entity that has not been properly recognized for the worth that they provide to society. It's just a number, and uh, that's terrible. I want to, uh, we're going to do this whole thing, but a personal thing. I went to the VA. I started going there in 2010 and went to, into Manhattan, and on the second floor they had an exhibit all kinds of different things about different wars. And they had some things about Vietnam. And they had a quote from a general, a Marine Corps general, saying basically what you said, my heart goes out to the mothers of these boys that have been sent yes. here to this place. And this is not the right place to be. You know, my, this is a Marine general saying, we should not be here. My heart goes out to them. Underneath that saying was a photograph of a Marine. He was one of my friends, John Ke uh, Tom Keppen. Right after that photograph was taken, he was killed. We had been together for a while. And one of the things I had, well, and after he got killed, I was in the rear one day and they said, you, someone has to inventory, you know, his personal belongings. We all had sea bags in the rear. So I had an inventory, all these sea bags. It's his sea bag. And I am doing the inventory. And at the bottom of the sea bag is a pack of letters. They were from uh, children in grammar school to him. He was a teacher. He taught in grammar school. Yes. And then he became a Marine officer. And that, you know, and he was a very good officer. And that thing about mothers losing their child, it's, I don't think there's anything worse than losing a child. You know, young. every death involves the uh, uh, depression of 70 people. Aunts, uncles, relatives, extended families. 
we think of uh, a number. But that number has to be increased by how it uh, affects the extended family uh, concerned with one soldier. It's not the death of a soldier. It's the death of a family, an extended family. And it's, uh, it's just awful. Mm-hmm. You know, while we're at this, Joe, I, I have to <coughs> tell you this. <coughs> I'm a student of uh, the Civil War, and uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, in four years, lost 700,000 people, 2% of the population. It would be equal to 8 million people. You'll find in your studies that the loss of life in the Civil War was 700,000 people. And it's easy to throw lives away. And if you visit the battleground, you'll see that there are gravestones of unknown soldiers. But they were known to their families. And uh, war is hell. And uh, nobody can support it. Um, you have to avoid it, and I hope, uh, but yet I, I don't have much uh, uh, satisfaction that uh, it'll be honored, but uh, there can't be a war in a foreign country in which we seek to impose our form of government on another country. Their culture is different, and it's a shame, but uh, uh, Afghanistan, all they do is fight. They wake up in the morning, they fight. That's their culture. We can't change it. We have a lot to do here in the United States about improving roads and uh, things that would benefit you, me, and the rest of the people who might be seeing this uh, uh, show. Uh, and by the way, I didn't compliment you your contribution to the practice of uh, criminal law as you plied the trade in the uh, Eastern District of New York. And I I thank you for your contribution uh, to that uh, service. And your service wasn't only in the military, it was in the uh, field of criminal justice and the American system of criminal justice, which is broken. Uh, We don't have to uh, spend time fixing up the uh, uh, governments in foreign countries. The American system of criminal justice is broken. Uh, Innocent people are prosecuted and sent to jail. And I might give you a number that would surprise you. Uh, Wikipedia says there are 120,000 Innocent people serving time in prison. The number is rather conservative. It has been said that there are 300 people, 300,000 people who are sitting in 8 by 12 cells when they are innocent of the crime that they've been convicted of. Innocent people. Our system is broken. The criminal justice system. We have work to do here in the United States to remedy that uh, without sticking our nose into the affairs of other countries. Let's fix what's broken here because what's broken here harms innocent people. And uh, a study I've made shows, unfortunately, that it tends to be black uh, Americans abused by the Southern system of justice that uh, brings uh, innocent people into the criminal justice system. There's nothing as horrendous as being in the sights of a uh, malevolent prosecutor. 
it's worse than perhaps being in the sights of an enemy soldier because it can destroy your life, your liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. And that's what the American system is in the criminal justice area. Uh, so we've got a lot of work to do at home without sticking our nose into the affairs of the problems of other countries. Okay, I just want to mention that uh, we didn't realize this until just recently, but we were on a really big case together. Uh, USA v. Frank Copa, where the government uh, said that uh, mafia had infiltrated Wall Street. They set up a bogus brokerage. We were co-counsel in that case, and we didn't even realize it until just recently. Yeah, uh, the Copa case dealt with uh, a very interesting uh, point. The way the government withholds helpful proof, proof that might uh, affect the verdict in a criminal case, and they hide that evidence from the uh, defendant who's on trial. Official misconduct is one of the six factors that uh, interfere with the right to a fair and just trial. And uh, I've spent my time trying to pursue uh, the uh, uh, persons who find themselves with no sponsor, no relative to push on their behalf, the criminal justice system, and uh, they sit in a cell for years, for decades, but they don't belong there uh, because uh, the government has chosen to hide proof, proof that would uh, help them secure their innocence. I, I give this story, Joe, if I could just tell you. There was a man tending his garden tending his garden. When six FBI agents arrived at five o'clock, six o'clock in the morning, as he was doing his weeding and uh, with long guns, and they arrested him. Arrested him for being part of a Madrid uh, bombing. And the government claimed that even though a fingerprint had been found, which was uh, uh, unable to be uh, identified for years, the FBI finally found a match. And it was to a man named Brian Mayfield. It's a case of enormous importance. They found that uh, even though the rest of the world had failed to make a match to this uh, Madrid bombing, uh, the FBI alone, despite Interpol's inability to match the fingerprint, the FBI matched the fingerprint and the man was arrested and had to sit in prison. Well, lo and behold, it was determined later on that the fingerprint analysis by the FBI was an error. Yes, we think of the fingerprint analysis as the gold standard in forensic science, but it's not. It's subject to uh, uh, error and uh, forensic science is what accounts for uh, enormous numbers of wrongful convictions. And uh, I only mention this because uh, there is a need to look into the criminal justice system, to look at the uh, uh, instances where people have been convicted. And I say to you that that war is a war that has to be waged to protect people, uh, innocent, but uh, nonetheless pursued by a malevolent prosecutor. 
now that the war is supposedly over, I want the government to turn to those 300,000 people and say, it's time to review cases where people have steadfastly asserted their innocence, but have not found a champion to pursue their case. And uh, uh, that's what I'm here for. I feel very strongly that there's a need to uh, look into the way the criminal justice system functions in the United States. Think about it. 300,000 people, innocent, but sitting in a jail for decades with nobody to champion their cause. We're about to end. We have a minute. What about the people, the prosecutors that put away innocent people? Yes, think? the prosecutors uh, put away innocent people, and uh, uh, but I don't think they uh, set out to say a uh, person is innocent and I'm going to put them away. They have a mindset. They fasten on a belief that a particular person is the person who committed the robbery or the murder, and they pursue that person to a point where it's not worth living. Because when you get in that sights, as I said, it's like uh, the sights of a gun. Uh, there's no escape. Uh, there was a man in Mississippi, Curtis Flowers, who was Already tried been, yeah. six times six times the case was finally we're done we have to pick it up we're done first show <laughs> oh, time.